Well, hello. Welcome everyone to Second Sunday Readings. My name is Sean Killingsworth and I'm the curator and host of this poetry series. And I'm really glad that you can be here today to join us for something really special. Um, today, we're doing something a little bit different. Instead of our usual reading, we're offering this space to the poets in the anthology, When There Are Nine, which is a collection of work dedicated to the memory of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I've really been looking forward to this reading. I attended one oh, about two weeks ago and it was just spectacular. So this is gonna be equally wonderful. And in another twist, instead of me, our host today will be Shanine A. Harris. She's one of the editors of When There Are Nine. Shanine wrote her first book at the age of nine. She's author of two books of poetry and a spoken word compilation. Her work has been a finalist in the Wolverine Farm Broadside Poetry Prize mm -hmm. and has appeared in Rattle, Crab Orchard Review, Watershed Review, and lots of other places. Shanine is a data governance product owner, which sounds really hard, <laughs> a poet, and a proud mama of three. Uh, everybody, if you could please take a moment right now to silence your cell phones and also please mute yourself so that no extraneous noises filter in by accident, I would be grateful. And with that, Shanine, I turn this reading over to you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for having us here. Uh, it is such an honor. You know, I was sharing with the group before this started that this is just that space that is so good to finally get to hear uh, the poets and their voices and to let them tell their story of Ruth uh, their way. So thank you for that. Uh, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wasn't always the icon RBG, right? She was a Joan in a classroom full of other Jones whose mother wanted her to have her, her own space and her own identity. She evolved from daughter to wife to mother to Justice Ginsburg to icon. So, so much of her life happened in between these dashes. So many, uh, a lot of the focus and some many people tend to focus on that time frame just that one little instance we wanted to capture her journey we wanted to capture the best way the best way that we know how and that's as poets uh, and as scribes of sort so you know Maya Angelou called her a great soul and we wanted it to be holistic so that we sought diverse voices we sought um voices that you know could keep Ruth Bader Ginsburg's journey and impact on a collective community uh, as Patricia Smith said, it keep it in the keep it from shifting rather to the realm of collective memory. So, thank each of the poets who will read tonight for their time and their talents and uh, their treasures that they contributed to this work. Uh, we truly, truly thank you for that. So, without ado, you guys don't want to hear me. That is not why you came here. Uh, so, you want to hear the poets. So, we are going to get this started, and we will be introducing the poets in the order that they appear in the book. Uh, the first one being Krista Lucas. Now, what will happen, I will read, and please, poets, feel free that um, after I read your bios and you read your poems, feel free to talk about your creative process and some of the things you gleaned from your work uh, after you read your poem. So Krista Lucas has read her work and led workshops in the United States and Europe. Uh, her essays, short stories, and interviews have been published in The Sun. Jewish Women's Literary Annual and Los Angeles Review of Books. She is the author of poetry collection, fan of my unconscious, poems from which appear in the best American poetry 2006 and the Writer's Almanac. Please join me in welcoming Krista Lucas. A childless woman is thus defined by her lack. While mother, tells all, serving as both noun and verb, childless alone is a modifier, needing further explanation. Nulla gravida, a woman who has never been pregnant, and nulla para, one who hasn't given birth, come from New Latin, nullus, no, not any. Unwieldy textbook terms and insufficient when you consider foster adoptive godmothers who may or may not have begotten offspring. So I say we need a word and I propose witch. It is as witches that we first appear to children, is it not? Living alone in the forest, ready to lure them in and eat them, demanding their hearts in a box made of jewels. In the same tales, the mothers are dead, replaced by the evil wives of hapless fathers desperate for someone to look after the children. The stepmothers work them like slaves, threaten to abandon them in the woods. 
Wouldn't you rather be the witch? Your walls made of gingerbread, the simplicity of cooking in one pot, perhaps vulnerable to being crushed by a falling house, but free. Your broom meant for flying. I wrote this poem. Um, well, I wrote it because I struggled with the question briefly of whether or not to have kids. And I realized that I just didn't really want them. Um, my grandfather pressured me since I was in high school, when are you gonna get married and have kids? And I'm like, well, not right now. Um, and then I married my first husband and uh, and it became even more clear that I didn't want kids. So I just realized that it wasn't for me. And it's fine if it's for other people, but uh, I just think that uh, it's not for me. And I think it should be a choice, whether you, obviously it should be a choice, um, whether or not to have children. And I believe that Ruth Bader Ginsburg would have supported that choice. So I decided to submit this poem to the anthology for that reason. Krista, thank you, thank you. And you know, when I read that poem and I heard call them witch, I'm like, oh my God, that is brilliant. Like, and then as you built that, so that was phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing your voice. And, I'm going to um, save all my questions till the end and come back because I want to make sure I give each poet a chance to read and introduce themselves before, I mean, excuse me, introduce their work uh, prior to asking my questions. But trust me, I have a question for you when we come back, when I come back to you. <laughs> okay. Um, having said that, I want to introduce our next poet. Uh, I think a lot of you already know her because she's the real host of Second Sunday Reading. Um, I'm just the stand in today. Sean Killingsworth, she, her has been published in Raw Fainiont Press, Type House Literary Journal, Stonecrest Review, Glass, a journal of poetry, poets resist, and elsewhere. Elsewhere, She is the anthology editor for the Martin Poetry Center, host and curator of Second Sunday Reading Series, and a poetry reader for the Kitchen Table Quarterly. Find her on Twitter at S. Shanessa and at Second Sunday Poetry. So now I introduce to you well, as her, actually, I'll say reintroduced to some, but welcome back to others, Sean Keelingsworth. Thank you so much, Shanine. Thank you everybody for being here. This is so much fun. I am just excited to share this poem and uh, I'm gonna just get right into it. It's a little long, so uh, I hope you have your water and your <laughs> whatever else handy. This is called Heritage, Homage to RBG. A hundred years ago, a neighborhood friend tipped them off helped my great-grandparents escape a violent erasure. Ukrainian Jews ran or died. Their villages obliterated in the pogroms and even the name of the shtetl is lost. Women in dirty kerchiefs pushed their families through the woods to the cities, to the boats where they boarded and weren't killed. My great-grandmother Charnia and Nusia, her husband, young and strong, gripped the wooden railing, nauseous, pushing toward life toward a future, still breathing. Renamed Charlotte and Nelson in America, they brought the future with them. My grandmother carried over in utero, rocked on a ship through the immigration lines of Philadelphia and kept pushing further north. Beverly Hanna was born five years before you. Like you, Joan Ruth, a dark haired, blue eyed beauty, also a scholar, a gifted economist. She told my father, her son, Having children is the end of a woman's career. She didn't push, settled on teaching French, your husband more willing even then to step back and make room for you. Lucky. Vivienne Jeanne, my own mother, trembling with a Catholic fear of hell and strangers, pushed past the small town suffocation of a history of women staying home, the suffocation of the Oxford committee telling her she wouldn't get the PhD she'd earned because she had a husband who would take care of her. And why give a woman the degree a man needs more? So she fled, 
pushed away and onto a ship that sailed to New York from Wales with me in her arms to sunshine, birth control, another master's degree, a career. A year and a half before you became a Supreme, I boarded a bus from New Jersey headed to Washington, saw with 200 other college women, loud and giddy, our youth and strength bundled with scarves and mittens and homemade signs, we marched to the White House, to the men in power, demanding our right to our own bodies, our lives. We felt such hope. It felt like a movement. But movements stall and sputter. Today is the hour of hope and desperation. Today we grind through the noon of bitter argument, grimaces, and underbreath curses when our children worry that our rage will leave them parentless. Your death makes us fear we will lose everything you worked so hard to win for us. But we keep going, women pushing forward regardless, despite, because of the struggle, wounds, barriers, prejudice, pushing for the rest of us, with us, the shtetls we come from, the families we love, we carry with us. Ruth, it's been a century at least, and we are still pushing. So that's a lot. <laughs> um, this poem was inspired by RBG's death. Um, I just remember, you know, hearing the news that she had died and just feeling crushed and, you know, sort of thinking historically about my own family and the families of my friends and how these rulings were going to affect us and my own daughter, you know, she's a teenager now. And I, you know, it terrifies me to think that some of her rights are being taken away before she's even had a chance to fully understand what they are. So that's kind of where this is coming from, this idea of, you know, we have to be strong and we have to keep pushing the way our families have pushed to keep us safe and healthy for centuries. And so, you know, in this sort of collective family of women and our, our beloveds, uh, we must and will keep pushing. So thank you. Oh, no, thank you for those words. And when I tell you guys that you guys have my heart racing, um, that is not an understatement at all. So I, I'm just speechless. Thank you. So um, again, I'm going to hold questions because I'm loving hearing your words. And so I'm going to go to the next poet. Um, this lady right here, Gail Brandeis, is the author most recently of the memoir, The Art of Misdiagnosis, and the novel and poems. My Restless Concerns, her novel, The Book of the Dead, won the Bellworthy Prize for Fiction of Social Engagement. Uh, I will admit that one of the uh, judges was Toni Morrison, who is someone I've studied and loved forever, so yay, Gail. <laughs> her poetry, essays, and short fiction have been widely published in places such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, O Magazine, and more. She has received numerous honors, and that is not an understatement, including a Barbara Mandingo Kelly Peace Poetry Award and Notable Essays and Best American Essays. Uh, she has served as the Inlandia Literary Laureate. So I want you guys to help me give a warm welcome to poet, teacher, and honestly, just an amazing personality, uh, Gail Brandeis. Oh, thank you so much, Janine, and thank you everyone for being here. I'm so delighted to be part of this reading, part of this anthology, part of this beautiful circle of poets. And um, I'll just read my poem, Tante Ruth. I think of her as Tante Ruth, Aunt Ruth in Yiddish, a truly great aunt, an older relative who might give me candy, give me advice, might pinch my cheek and remind me to speak my mind, to stand up for my rights, to never settle for anything less than equality, anything less than justice. My mother nurtured this feeling. She told me the true love of her life, her sister's psychiatrist, the married man she dated starting when she was 16 until he died 10 years later, his last name Bader, was Ruth's brother. She could have been your aunt, she said, had he not died, had he fertilized the egg that became me. I wanted to believe her, but couldn't find any mention of a brother with her lover's name in any of Ruth's biographies. and would never want any dad but my own especially not a man who preyed on teenage girls, a man who could have been arrested for what he did to my mom, 
a man Ruth would have despised, would have dressed down had he been her brother, had she known what he had done. Still, I want her to be my aunt, my great aunt, my Tante Ruth, want her to still be alive. My sister, who's named for my mother's lover, I'm named for a pedophile she recently shuddered, a label we hadn't thought to apply to him before now, recently sent me a Ruth Bader Ginsburg menorah, the eight candle holders spelling out, I dissent, the shamus Ruth herself, the gold holder on top of her head like a crown chakra. She will be lighting the way for us this Hanukkah. Tante Ruth always lights the way. You can see her, still haven't glued her back together. Um, <laughs> she fell apart in our recent move, but is still lighting the way. And I'm so grateful that this anthology continues to light her way for us moving forward, to carry her light forward. And so, so delighted to be part of it. Miguel, we are so glad that you have chosen to be a part of it with us. So thank you. Uh, I think my voice is trying to tell me, don't talk too much, Janine, because it's going. So I want to make sure I get the next poet out before my voice goes. I'm like, so, this is real special. So Susan Rich is the author of four books of poetry, including Cloud Pharmacy, The Alchemist's Kitchen, Cures Include Travel, and The Cartographer's Tongue. She is co-editor of The Strangest of Theaters, Poets Crossing Borders with Ilya Kaminsky and Brian Turner. Her awards include a Penn USA Award, a Fulbright Fellowship, and a Times Literary Supplement Award. Rich's poems have appeared in the Antioch Review, New England Review, O Magazine, and elsewhere. She has two books forthcoming, Gallery of Postcards, Maps, News, and Selected, and Blue Atlantis, Atlas, excuse me. Um, in case you guys haven't figured it out, these are some dynamic poets. And so before she reads, Susan reads, I want to tell you, don't just let your exposure to their work stop here. Uh, please go seek out some of their other work, go read some of their other uh, publications. They are all phenomenal in their own right. And we just had the privilege of just having a little bit of what they can, they can give. So please, by all means, go out and find these poets and read up on them for yourselves. Without further ado, Susan Rich. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shanine. Thank you, everyone. This is just a wonderful way to spend a Sunday afternoon. I, you know, there's all sorts of things one can say about Zoom, but this might be my favorite part of it to be in my very messy office and be with you. So thank you. This poem is called Elephant and Opera, and it's for RBG. Hear the eagles cry in legalese as they lift their black and white quills above the tide line, pulsing the air with their prodigious wings. Is this the reason I wake fitfully each hour to note again that you have passed? Understanding should be elementary, global news reports and obituaries, but your death elides the lacework of a civilized life. Justice, as name, justice as psalm, justice as supreme decency, undaunted by the indecent remark in favor of the Hawaiian collar, elephant rides and opera. But this is not enough. Your loss is one our country cannot master as mourners gather after midnight on the cold courthouse steps. It is the eve of Rosh Hashanah. What might you advise? Teach, empathize. Dipping apples into honey, we agonize. So I never know whether to talk about a poem before I read it or after, but I hope that, um, I guess I don't like spoiler alerts. I, I hope that it's clear that I this was inspired by um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death. And um, we were talking a little bit before we got started. I remember exactly where I was. I was on Whidbey Island, which is off the coast of Washington state um, for a getaway weekend with my friend, the poet Kelly Russell Agadon. 
And we were all set for a great relaxing weekend after the retreat we run called Poets on the Coast. And at the very beginning of the weekend, I had apples cut to do the apples and honey for the eve of um, the Jewish New Year. And it came on that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had died. And it just felt like there went the happy, great weekend. It, it just cast this whole, as you can imagine, um, I don't have a, I don't have the right word. It's more than shadow. But that meant that I had a draft of something that was pretty rough. And I don't know if I would have done anything with it. It felt too big a subject. Um, I had loved Ruth Bader Ginsburg for years um, from afar. And so when the call came out for this anthology, that gave me a reason to work more um, on this poem. I'm, I'm not sure it's at all clear from just hearing it once, but it's a love sonnet. And um, yeah, I think that's probably enough. So thank you. Thank you for listening. You know, it's interesting you said enough because, so I have a couple of questions for the poets and even though some of them are catered more to one poem or another, please, any poet, feel free to respond. Uh, but again, it's interesting you said enough because one of the poems that we didn't read uh, but that I kind of think about often is the one called Dainu, meaning it would have been enough, right? And so just speaking to the idea of work being complete, sufficient to a purpose, um, would you got, why don't you guys just kind of talk about how do you determine when yours is complete enough, your work, you know, sufficient to the purpose? How do you know, how do you determine when it's done? I mean, I have poems I've sat for years, so I know I can use some help in that department, so please. I can jump in. Um, one answer is I never know. And the other answer is that I, I share it. I mean, there's a couple of things. One is if I can read through the entire poem without hearing a glitch, without thinking, oh, that's terrible, then that's a good start if I'm not stopping myself when I read it aloud. And then if it's something like this poem that I really care about and I want it, I know it's going to go to a, a good audience, I have probably two or three poet friends that I'll share it with and say, you know, well, I don't even have to say it. They know I want them to give me real feedback and real suggestions. And um, so it's a process of getting to a point where I feel kind of um, exhausted. I think it's, um, oh shit, I think, it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um, Paul Valray, who says a poem is never finished, only abandoned. So when I feel that I'm about to abandon it, I go to my very close poet friends and get their feedback. And um, then at some point it feels like, oh, this must have just written itself. The words all seem right. And I forget the hours and hours and draft after draft. So there's some things that might be helpful, I hope. For me, oh, I feel like a poem is done when it's published. I feel like if somebody likes it enough to put it in print, then I'm done. <laughs> um, although sometimes I will still go back and tinker. Um, there are, you know, things that were published a decade ago that I look back on and I just, oh, I can't believe this. But, uh, but usually I feel like if somebody's willing to, to dedicate some ink to it, then I'm ready to let it go. <laughs> so it's an interesting thing that you said that. So the way I work, guys, I always have a follow-up. <laughs> I used to be a teacher, so most people who know me, they know I always have a follow-up. So the first question was kind of the setup one about when do you know things are done? And I asked that because a lot of people still believe that Ruth Bader Ginsburg work wasn't done. Um, do you think in the light of that comment that your poem is, is as complete as it can be now or that as times are evolving, uh, that if you had to resit down with this work, that there would be more that you would want to tell? I don't think her work is done because of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Um, I just, I, I don't like that decision and I don't know, I, it probably wouldn't have happened if she were still alive. So that's my opinion. How do you think your work would change or evolve given the current climate? Like, do you think your poem would be considered done right now? Uh, if, you know, if you, were, if you were rewriting that poem right now or adding to it, do you think it'd be considered done? Or do you think there would be more you'd want to say? This particular poem, it has been published and I went back and changed it. Um, 
but I don't think it would change with her being alive. But someone who had an abortion or had, knows someone who needs an abortion, if they wrote a poem about that, I would think it wouldn't be done because if they live in a state where it's gonna be illegal, then they're in trouble. Thank you. So next question. Uh, in the previous readings, we talked about this thing of what surprised you in, your, in the work, uh, what surprised you about the collection. Um, in what way do you hope that your work or the collection surprises the reader when they get a chance to, to partake of it? And this can be anybody, uh, but just, yes. You guys are awfully quiet, you're scary. <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump in. I, I think we're all, I think we're all trying to be polite because <laughs> I know I want to hear from Gail and she's been very quiet. Um, the question, I think humor, I think um, I teach film, I teach, I teach poetry, but I also teach film and I teach um, the documentary RBG to my students, um, to undergraduates. And there's so much in there about her, for example, loving opera, going to operas, being in an opera the night um, the night of or the night after Trump was elected, and also having um, been friends with a Supreme Court justice who um, whose views were very different than her own. So I love her sense of humor. I love that she has a quote in there that I'm 80 years old and everybody wants to take their picture with me. There's just so much, you know, we know her brilliance and we may know um, the story of her life, but the humor and the um, generosity of heart, I, I just, that's, that was what I wanted to have come through. What? Anyone else? Yeah, I think it's always such a delightful surprise to get a peek into other people's um, inner worlds. And this anthology offers a lot of peeks into different perspectives and ways of, um, of looking at the same person, and which is just a constant surprise and delight to, to see how all of us have resonated with or had questions about this one woman and the things that it's triggered within us that are sometimes deeply personal and sometimes very political. And um, yeah, I, I love being surprised by just getting access to um, someone else's inner life, which this allows um, in so many wonderful ways. And I loved your question earlier. I, I, I don't know why I didn't chime in, but um, <laughs> I feel like my poem would have grown um, had I uh, had more time to write it. I shared at a recent reading how this poem just kind of like plopped out of me. It was it was a poem that was ready to be written. And so it was really quite easy. It was one of those poems that felt like a gift because it just there it was. Um, but I feel like I could add layers of complication to it if I were to return to it, including um, some anger toward RBG, which I hadn't known I would feel. Um, I had seen some people express anger that she didn't step aside when Obama was still president and he could have you know, consciously um, made a great replacement uh, decision. Um, and in my grief at her loss, I hadn't known to feel that anger or I, I think I would be surprised to hear that I might feel some anger toward her in a little bit, but that that has um, it hasn't dimmed my love for her or my admiration of her, but it's complicated the way I think about her. And I think that I would add that complication to the poem. I thank you for saying that because a lot of people don't want to admit that they're angry. And so I find that to be um, very refreshing to hear from you. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm not going to share too much about me because this is not about me, but the thing that surprised me was that I actually grew a genuine understanding and compassion for RBG that I did not have. You know, I think we assume that everybody's coming from the same space, 
I didn't come from that space. I knew her as a justice, but all those other things that people are connecting with, I didn't connect with, not initially, I really didn't. And it's been through the poems that you all have written that I have this almost love for her that I didn't have before. Um, an understanding of her that I don't think I would have even sought out before. So uh, for me, that was surprising. It was very surprising. I, that's something I didn't expect at all. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, you know, and I don't think that I can know the, the anger. Um, I can only appreciate the awe that you guys have all instilled at this point through your work. That's a pretty amazing statement, actually, for to and and super gratifying to hear as a poet that that we have educated somebody and helped you kind of change your mind, right? I mean, I I think from from my standpoint, RBG was always sort of a um, cultural icon. You know, I went to, I remember her getting sworn in. I remember her kind of rising through the ranks, and I I was very amused by the whole notorious RBG kind of meme that she became. But I also, you know, I, I think the anger that Gail brought up is really relevant. I think that she kind of allowed herself to fall in love with that meme of herself. And, and I think she believed that she was invincible even when it was pretty clear to everybody else that her body was saying, oh, you're definitely not invincible. Um, and so, yeah, that, that complicating anger, I think probably is difficult for a lot of us, but, but the, the, you know, being able to share our feelings with a reader and be able to being able to connect with a reader in a way that helps readers see a different perspective is just so gratifying. So thank you for saying that, Shanine. Oh, absolutely. So I don't want to, I've been watching the time because I can talk and I don't want to take up all the time. So I do want to make sure that if anyone else has questions before I pose more, uh, that they have the opportunity to ask them. Can and I, I, can I say something first? Mm -hmm. um, you know, once you said that, I realized I read about that too. And she had cancer so many times. And I just thought, uh, you know, if she, Obama would have made a good choice. And so I think what someone said that she kind of fell in love with that meme of herself. But I kind of wish she hadn't, even though she was great, um, because we could have had someone who would have lived and, and still carried on her legacy. Thank you. I don't wanna cut off anybody else, but, but yeah, please. Yeah, I, I'd love to just respond to that too, because I think it was such a hard, hard thing to, um, I struggled with as well because of what happened afterwards and then there was the whole thing that she had asked uh, I can't remember exactly what it was but she asked Trump to appoint somebody a woman or someone who I, I can't remember what it was but there was a request that came out that was basically on her deathbed that her granddaughter gave that of course was ignored but what I came to was when when Ginsburg came onto the court, she was a centrist. She was, you know, given what the world looked like at that point, she was the centrist. She was very much kind of looking at things in her own way and not kind of going with a particular group. And although I, of course, wish, given what we know now, that she had stepped down, I felt like she was kind of being true to who she was and the kind of, you know, there were stories about how her husband had to come to the court at 7.30 at night after he cooked dinner to get her home because she just kept going. So as much as, you know, we're paying for it, I also think that she was true to herself. And, you know, we could say she should have thought of the nation, et cetera, but I think she was staying powerful in the way that she always had been and couldn't read the future. So for what that's worth. Actually, I think that lends me to ask Krista a question. And, and again, I don't mind others asking questions, but um, so please feel free to jump in. But there was a comment, there was a line in your poem and talking about being vulnerable yet vulnerable yet free. And I think that line intrigued me. And I was hoping that you could kind of just give us some more insight into the concept of vulnerable yet free. Uh, especially through the lens through that that lens of you know we call, talked about being the witch and the free and the lens could you talk some more about that and just the insight into that that line um well i think that the wicked witch of the west was crushed by that house in the wizard of oz and so that 
that's an image of vulnerability, right? She's, she's crushed by a house, but at the same time, so that's vulnerable, but then the witch's broom is a common thing. So I thought, well, witches, I didn't even think about this consciously, but I just realized like witches have brooms. And I think somebody, I was in a critique group at the time. And I believe I wrote that line, but I know that it was, um, it was well received because I think mothers are more associated with sweeping. No offense to any mothers out there. And believe me, I could sweep my house a lot more often. But um, I just thought that they're both symbols of witches, like getting crushed by a house and, and a broom. And so, of course, the vulnerability is getting crushed and then the freedom is flying on your broom instead of sweeping. Excellent. And for me, um, it does represent some freedom because I'm not tied to children. And I, I love my niece and nephews, but I really don't want them living with me. <laughs> um, and I taught school for years and I never wanted to take a student home. So I think there's sort of undue pressure on women to be nurturers. And, um, and I don't know that there's that same pressure on men. And I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it's interesting because you find these little themes throughout the poems and stuff like that. I'm thinking, okay, are you guys reading my notes or is this just naturally evolving? Because literally the next question I had was for Sean and it was this idea of why give a woman a degree men need and more, need, men need more. And I was thinking about the comment Serena Williams made. Um, you know, she just retired from tennis. And one of the comments she made is that women can't really have it all right, you have to choose. And so I really wanted to just kind of talk to Sean about the line, you know, that whole thing of what men need more versus women. And are we, you know, in a space, you know, I think her work says maybe not, but I want her to speak and say, hey, are we, what, what space are we really in in light of a comment like that coming from Serena Williams? I mean, who has power, money, if anybody could be independent, right? And, and, and live freely, I would think it would be her. Right, right. Well, that, that, it is a real thing that was said to my mother when she was sitting in front of the Oxford committee. Uh, she had finished all the work for her, her doctorate and uh, they uh, asked her, so are you going to be, are you getting married? What's your situation? And she said, yes, I, you know, this, this man that I'm, I don't remember if they were married yet at the time or not, but uh, they said, well, we'll just give you the, the C Phil, which is sort of the equivalent to like master's plus. Um, because you know your husband will take care of you, and I don't know if they had only a certain number of PhDs to hand out, but they said, well, you know, a man needs a PhD because he has a family to support, so you don't really need it. And she carried that with her for, I mean, decades. She was bitter and angry for the longest time, and it never left me. So that that's a a real thing that happened. Wow. And I, I guess in light of, we like to believe things have changed so much but through the lens that you just told that from your mother's perspective and now um how much do you think we've really evolved i guess in that sense like with that line could it be tagged today I mean, I mean i don't know i know i know a lot of academics who complain bitterly about the, the inherent sexism in, in the system i am not an academic um so i can't speak about it from my own perspective but i know that certainly in the business world I, i'm in marketing you know as my my day job and uh, it's definitely run by men, for sure. Um, I, I think that th there's so much work to still be done. And I think at this point, um, it, we cannot solely rest on women's shoulders. Men have to step up to the plate and get involved. You know, we can't be afraid of the word feminist or we have to find some other word, uh, but we all have to fight. You know, I, I, I really don't think that anything can change unless everybody's in on it, unless everybody has skin in the game. You know, one of the, the reasons um, when Rebecca and Ashley, the other editors, uh, asked me to be a part of this, one of the things I thought about was the relationship between the African American and Jewish communities. Um, and so when I thought about that, it was almost a moral obligation to be a part of this as well, because understanding that the true success happens when we partner, not necessarily when we try and stand alone. So I wholeheartedly hear you and, and agree with that sentiment. 
uh, you know, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm really, really, truly going to for real, for real going to be done. You know, you know, you see your kids for real, for real, for real, for real. I'm done with this last question in terms of the questions I have. Uh, and, and this one kind of goes to that idea of the collective conscious and memory. Um, have we, uh, and this is just personal opinion, have we uh, provided a space for a generation who only know her as the notorious R RBG, uh, provided enough context, enough history, enough diversity in presenting who she is, uh, that she stays relevant and not just kind of re just pushed back to our collective memory? I'll, I'll jump in on this one. I think that as we're watching, we are seeing the suppression of history happening every day in various states across this country. And, you know, I, I, kids are still being taught the quote unquote classics, right? My kid is reading Othello this year, which is great. It's a lovely play, uh, but there's not a whole lot of contemporary news that's happening uh, or that's being unpacked for kids. Um, and, you know, living in a state that's theoretically quite progressive there's there's it's like a, it's like an electric wire that the teachers or maybe it's probably administrators and the school boards don't want to touch so i i think you know maybe it's up to the poets to create that legacy so that it doesn't get lost because schools are certainly not doing it well my school did a terrible job teaching history i mean my my um my my sophomore year, I took a, I don't know whether it was world history or US history, but the teacher, um, all she did was hand out worksheets or have us answer the questions at the back of the chapter. And she said that she believed in learning by doing. I'm like, okay, well, doing worksheets doesn't really count as doing. And then um, my junior year, I took world, another one. And that teacher um, just showed videos all the time. In fact, one student just got up and walked out. So I did not learn anything in either of those classes. The time I learned the most was when we had a sub in American history and he actually knew something about the Civil War and told us about it. But otherwise, nothing. So I think, history education needs to be revamped entirely. Because when I got to college, I was like, I have no, I mean, no idea about historical events. So in that context, I hope that Ruth Bader Ginsburg's memory will be um, presented as it should be. Thank you. I'll just jump in real quick. I'm putting in that there's a documentary that I mentioned that I teach and my students often in a feminist film class haven't heard of Ruth Bader Ginsburg because that's just what happens when you're a freshman or sophomore in college. But the film RBG is a great documentary and I just checked it is on Prime for free. I have watched it. Sometimes when I'm really sad, I just put it on because it is. it just has such an uplifting sense. And it also gives her actual cases that she worked on. So before she was on the Supreme Court, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't realize women couldn't have their own separate checking account and couldn't have a passport in their name. So all sorts of things that she made happen. It's both uplifting and fun and students love it but it does a fantastic job in terms of history and what she did for us that so many of us don't know. I didn't know until I watched that film. So I highly recommend, I think it's only a little over an hour. Um, put it on tonight when you're making dinner, you'll have fun. Uh, and thank goodness we have this anthology now as part of the record for people who want to, to learn about RBG as a you know fully three-dimensional, human being who's inspired so many folks. Absolutely, absolutely. Sean, uh, did you wanna open up in case anybody else had questions? I, cause that was the last set of questions I actually had. To tell you the truth, Second Sunday doesn't do Q and A, oh. but, but <laughs> look, this is your show. Um, so uh, if anybody wants to, to jump in and ask a question, we definitely have a few minutes left. So please feel free if you wanna, 
you know, get a, an autograph from one of the poets, uh, we can probably mail you something. <laughs> And while we're waiting to see if they have questions um, there, you know, we do have the Facebook page, we do have the website um, and the pre order uh, is you can pre order the book. So if you would drop all that in the chat for me, that would be great. You got it. I think everybody's still stuck from Sunday dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's okay. Hang on, where's the chat? I'm going to post all of this stuff so everybody can please go buy a book. Go to the website, check yes. out the, the cover is spectacularly beautiful, I have to say. Um, it was in the flyers that I'd sent out, so I'm sure everybody's seen it a um, hundred times. But uh, Janine did that cover. Oh, you did? <laughs> beautiful. That's part of that that IT stuff over there that I work on sometimes. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and since Ashley has spoken up, I want to make sure that Rebecca and Ashley, I think I've seen Rebecca chat chiming in as well. Um, Ladies, if you are not on camera, please come on camera for a second. If you'd like to say something, just introduce yourselves. Uh, please do so, uh, you know, because honestly, you know, I was I was brought in, but these ladies right here, the story came, the idea, um, a lot of hard work from these ladies. So please, uh, Ashley Konsa and Rebecca, are you there? Hi, thanks for coming. <laughs> okay. I don't I'm, I'm here and yeah, thanks for coming. I think y'all are sick of me because I've been bombarding the <laughs> <laughs> But I'm not sick of you. I, I love all the poets and all these voices and Shanine, this is really wonderful, wonderful community here. Absolutely. So Shanine, your questions were brilliant. Um, I, I felt like, you know, they weren't meant to be show, like stompers. It was just, you know, I'm very I, when I say you guys have literally enlightened me, um, and every time I read them, I get a different line. So I feel like I'm learning probably more than anybody from this. I don't know if that was supposed to happen, but I, I keep going through and every time I read them, like, I just, I just get something different. Like, I want to know, like, where'd that come from? And I want to know about this. <laughs> so um, I hope I didn't badger you guys too much, but know that it was truly my curiosity and just love and appreciation of your work. Um, I could have gone on forever, but I didn't want to keep drilling you guys. So <laughs> Thank you for being patient with me. And having said that, everyone who has joined us today, uh, I can't thank you enough. And I am saying this from a very pure lens, pick up the book, read it. Um, there is something for everyone. I don't care what walk of life you came from. I don't care what your background in reading is. Uh, there is truly something that everyone can connect with, everyone can question and challenge and even put in light to their current situation. So. Um, Thank each of you again from the bottom of my heart, seriously, for, for, for just trusting us with your treasures. And thank Rebecca and Ashley for allowing me to be a part of this. And I will turn it back over to Sean. Thank you for having us. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Shanine, for being such a fabulous host. This has really been a joy. Um, I'm gonna have to have you on to host some of the second Sundays when I wanna take a little break. <laughs> Um, so thank you, everybody. I'm really grateful to the poets for bringing such powerful work. I'm grateful to Shanine, Ashley, and Rebecca for letting me have like this really special extra second Sunday reading. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, this is being recorded. The recording will be up on the second Sunday YouTube channel in the next, I would say, 10 days to two weeks. I have to um, get it to my editor. I'm not the tech guru that he is. Um, and all of you are invited to come to the next Second Sunday Reading, which will be on uh, September 11th at 3 o'clock Pacific, so 6 o'clock Eastern. Uh, thanks again. Uh, I hope to see all of you then. And please run out and buy the book. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>